Good afternoon, everyone. We're just going to wait just a couple minutes for people to join us. Okay, we will get started. Good afternoon again, everyone. My name is Josh Stripmatter, and I would like to welcome you to Stripmatter Wealth's Smart Money webinar series. Thank you for joining us today. Our presentation today is titled Extended Care and Long-Term Care Planning. For those of you that don't know us, we are Stripmatter Wealth Management Group, a registered investment advisor located in downtown Fort Worth, Texas. We specialize in investment management, financial planning, estate planning, and real estate investing. We've been in business since 2007 and serve clients throughout the United States. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. All of you have access to the chat feature, so if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to type those in, and we will be happy to answer those for you. Also, we'll, we will be sending out a replay of today's webinar via email, so if you miss something, don't panic, we, you'll have the ability to watch it again. And you're welcome to forward this presentation and any of our presentations to your friends and family if you think it would be beneficial. Today's webinar is meant to be purely educational and not meant as tax or legal advice. Please talk to your licensed professional before taking any action on any of the information in this presentation. For, for more information, including key disclosures, please visit our website at stripmatterwealth.com. Now let me introduce to you our speaker today. Susan Carlson is a, an external long-term care representative for Crep Life Insurance Services. And in her role, she manages existing uh, relationships with different advisors to help them to offer long-term care services or insurance to their, to their, uh, to their clients. Uh, she resides in Phoenix, Arizona with her daughter, Ava, and uh, they have many family pets. So without further ado, let me introduce and bring on to you Susan Carlson. Susan, how are you doing today? Great, thank you, and thank you for having me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. We appreciate you being here today. Oh, and I appreciate you having me. Uh, it's finally cooled down here in Phoenix. I know it's been a hot summer slash fall nationwide, uh, but we're actually having uh, a little bit of rain, and they were just saying it's been months since we've had rain, so it's very, very nice. And as Josh had, had sta stated, um, what I'm going to cover today really is what we refer to extended care and the different ways that we can help offset the costs of extended care planning. So this is probably one of my favorite quotes, and it's by Rosalind Carter. And it really shows that all of us in one way or another are going to be affected by someone, whether it's ourselves or a loved one, who's going to need care for an extended period of time. And what the quote says is those, there are four kinds of people in this world. Those who have been caregivers, those who currently our caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. So the discussion about long-term care planning or extended care planning, it really shouldn't be focused on whether or not you're going to need care for an extended period of time. But what the, what the discussion and really what you should be thinking about is if, I was to need care for an extended period of time, how would that affect my family? How would that affect my spouse? How would that affect my children? And even if you have grandchildren, how would that affect them? So what we're gonna to cover today very briefly, and we're gonna just do a very big picture. Uh, what my goal is, is to have you reach out to Josh and his team to set up a meeting because planning for an extended care event really should be personalized and, and directed just for you because there is no one perfect 
um, solution. There's a lot of different types on the marketplace, which we'll cover today, but just to know that there's not one perfect solution. So we're going to talk about what is the definition of needing care for an extended period of time? What types of care are out there and really what is actually being utilized and who's paying for that care? And then again, what types of insurance plans are in the marketplace to help offset some of those costs for care for an extended period of time? So a lot of times, instead of calling it extended care, people call it long-term care. But when you hear the words long-term care, what do you automatically think of? You think of nursing homes and you think of elderly individuals or an end-of-life event. And that is not what long-term care really is. Long-term care is measured in two ways. It's measured by needing assistance physically. So think of what you did this morning to get ready for your day. And we refer to these as activities of daily living. So we all got in and out of bed, which is referred to as transferring, waiting until the morning and the ability to use the restroom on our own. We then got a shower, got dressed, and had breakfast. So if I was in a car accident and I was injured in such a way where I couldn't get in and out of the shower and get dressed on my own, and the doctor said, Susan, it's going to take you at least six months to get back up on your feet. I need long-term care. So it's not a place, meaning it's not a nursing home. And it's not necessarily an end of life event. And it's not something that's going to affect me for the rest of my life. So that's why we tend to start, that's why we're now referring to it as needing care for an extended period of time. Because what defines it as long is that it has to be expected to last 90 days or longer. And the other way that it's measured is by cognitive impairment. So this is where your Alzheimer's, your dementia, or your memory loss falls. Insurance, your health insurance, is not designed to cover these types of scenarios because insurance, health insurance, is designed to cover short-term illnesses that need skilled care, meaning doctors and nurses, hospital visits, long-term care, I don't need a doctor to come into my home to help me get in and out of the shower and get dressed. That's what we call custodial care. And our health insurance, whether it's Medicare or maybe my PPO, maybe I have Kaiser, does not cover custodial care. Again, when you hear the words long-term care, you automatically think nursing homes, and that's not where care is happening. Now, it was years ago because we only had home care and nursing home. Well, now we have all different types of care that's being offered. We have assisted living facilities. We have group homes that are becoming very popular. And just we have adult daycare. So if my, let's say my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Right now, she still can, you know, live on, her uh, live on her own, take care of herself, but maybe I'm not comfortable leaving her all by herself while I go to work. I could actually take her to some type of community center, an adult daycare, uh, for her so that way she continues to be engaged and, you know, and then somebody is there to help make sure she doesn't hurt herself or maybe you know, leave a burner on or something like that. Nursing homes are still being utilized, but it's more of an end of life. So now care, it happens at home, and a majority of care is done by family members, um, people like ourselves who are forced to becoming a caregiver because our loved one now needs care and we never had a plan put into place of what we would do if we needed care for an extended period of time. So when you're doing your planning, what you need to be thinking about is having that care at home, 
or needing care in assisted living or in a group home, if you will. And nursing homes are now more or less an, oh, by the way, if you have to go to a nursing home, this plan might cover a portion of that cost. So what is the impact of being forced to become a caregiver? Because a lot of us, especially women, if something was to happen to my husband, of course I would step up and provide care. But could I, can I become a 24-hour caregiver? And the answer is no. I, can, I might think I could do this, but in reality, I could not. The amount, the amount of stress that that would put on of trying to balance taking care of him and then also maintaining, you know, perhaps I still have children at home, but, you know, trying to maintain the house and, and all of my other, do, you know, uh, responsibilities is going to prove to be too much. This is what I see all the time, and that's the sibling tension. You're always going to have one child who this is going to get dumped on, if you will. And it's the child who lives the closest or the daughter who lives the closest. So in my case, my sister lives in Colorado. I live here in Arizona, and my parents lived here in Arizona when they were alive. So naturally, of course, I would be the one to provide as much care as I could. Well, it's always the sibling who lives the farthest who's going to have the most opinions and, you know, saying, uh, you know, well, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. And no matter how much I try, there's going to be tension. And I can almost guarantee you that two of your children very well might not ever speak to each other again due to the tension caused by caregiving. We have the decline in well-being. It's a proven fact that the caregiver, that our health will decline faster than the person that we're taking care of because of all the emotional stress and also all the uh, physical stress as well. I can't imagine trying to pick up my spouse, nor can I, if he was to slip and fall in the shower. If this was to happen at a younger age, the loss of income. Eventually, I'm going to have to quit my job to become a 24-hour caregiver. How is that going to affect our standard of living? A lot of the insurance products that are out there have what's called a care coordinator, which I think is the strongest benefit out of the insurance policies. And what the care coordinator is, is there's somebody, and they're usually local, and I could say to this person, who do you know? Who do you know? What group homes do you know in the area? Because the insurance companies can't tell you where you should go. They can just send you a list and say, here's all the group homes that are licensed. For me, it would be licensed in the Phoenix area. And all I have is a list, okay? And, and I don't know where to start, where to go. This is my mom. I could be where I need to find her a place, you know, tomorrow and just pure panic mode or home care agencies. So having somebody who might have a little bit of insight, who might also know different resources in the area, to me is worth more than the benefits the policy will pay. The care is expensive. And regardless of what your portfolio looks like, it is going to be a large, um, it can really bite into that. And again, think about your spouse. If you were to spend, you know, time in a nursing home, assisted living, you know, it's tough because these are averages. And it's kind of like, you know, you've got such large swings. If you want to go to a beautiful assisted living facility, you're going to be paying a lot more than $57,000 a year. Um, so this can affect anybody's portfolio. And why would you wanna pay for this dollar for dollar if we could show you a way to leverage your money and to pay pennies on the dollar? Why do you wanna spend your hard earned money to pay for long-term care when you don't have to? These numbers are, you know, of course, going up. And what's really pushing them up, we don't follow the medical 
inflation, okay? Because if you think about it, long-term care, we're tied more to labor. So where our challenges are is finding the people to work and finding the home care aides. And what COVID did, it was pretty interesting, is what COVID did is the nursing home uh, uh, prices didn't increase the way that they normally did because a lot of families took their loved ones out of the nursing homes when COVID was there. And home care is what really skyrocketed because people were trying to keep their loved ones at home. And then with the home care aides, you know, they had all of this additional, you know, like health precautions they have to take, all this more additional paperwork they have to do because of COVID. And then again, trying to find the qualified workers is really pushing the cost of home care up. So this is what I suspect we're going to really see an increase um, versus the nursing homes. So who pays for home care? I mean, pays for long-term care. I can honestly say that insurance, health insurance, does not cover it. Because what Medicare and most of your health insurance covers they cover for something that you're going to more than likely recover from, something that's going to last less than 100 days. It doesn't pay for a condition that's going to last longer than 100 days, right? And what's the definition of long-term care? Needing assistance for 90 days or longer. Medicare might, might pay a little bit for a nursing home. So if you were in, and this is actually my mom um, actually had this, where um, she had a stroke and she was in the hospital completely, it was completely independent, no idea. The next day she was, all she could move was her uh, left forearm. Went into the hospital, she was there for almost two weeks. And then we moved her to a rehab facility that was actually under the title of nursing home. She was there, oh my gosh, I think maybe like 15 days, had another stroke, went back to the hospital, and that's when, when she passed. So all of her expenses um, were covered by Medicare. Now, being in this industry, um, I'm a single mom. I have a daughter. I actually bought a insurance policy for my mom and dad. And this is actually before I had my daughter. And I paid the premium for their long-term care insurance because I knew that if anything happened with my parents, it would fall on my shoulders because my sister lived out of town. And I'm just not, I just knew I couldn't be a caregiver. You know, I just don't have that in me. So I had a policy for her all along, and when she was in the rehab facility, I was out looking, you know, for a group home for her, found a beautiful group home, and the night before she was, you know, to move in is when she had the second stroke. So <clears throat> even though I had a policy, it was fantastic because I didn't have to worry about cost. I went out and found her the nicest group home that I could because we had an insurance policy that was going to cover everything. But we, you know, Medicare did cover something in, in her scenario, but you can see here that after the 100th day, Medicare doesn't cover anything. It's not designed to cover long-term care. Now, Medicaid, now if I hadn't have had a policy for my mom, and let's say that she did live through that stroke, she would have been dehabilitated for the rest of her life, okay? And she would have eventually spent all of, um, all of her savings because, you know, we, we grew up very modestly and she would have still needed care and, and would have run out of money. And that's when the state would have come in and, and paid, for her, uh, paid for her care. But my mom would have had to spend down to $1,000 before the state came in. So that means her 401k, you know, my dad's 401k that, you know, she inherited after he passed, 
everything would have had to go except for her house. She could have kept her house. And then Medicaid would start to pay her bills. However, Medicaid has the ability to put a lien on her home. So after she dies, they could come back and recoup from the sale of the house whatever they paid for her care. Now, my dad was a veteran, and I still bought a policy, you know, for my mom and dad, and I still paid for it, even though he was a VA, just because I wanted them to have choices. I didn't want him to have to use the VA facilities, um, you know, just with the long waiting list, uh, the ability to, to even be able to access benefits. It's very limited and I just wanted my parents to be able to have the best of care. And then of course, you know, paying out of your own pocket. And unfortunately, a majority of individuals, because they didn't plan for whatever reason, end up paying out of their own pocket for long-term care expenses. So when you're looking at doing a plan, and again, think of your family when you're putting this together. How is this going to affect my spouse, her standard of living? How is this going to affect my kids, my grandchildren? If everything I saved for them, maybe, you know, for the college, for your grandchildren, if I have to use that towards my long-term care expenses, where is that money going to come from? And, and what we look to do is maybe instead of, um, you know, maybe we have a bunch of money in mutual funds or CD, you know, your just-in-case monies. And we look to carve out a tiny bit of that and move that over into a long-term care um, planning fund, where if you need care for an extended period of time, we have a fund just for that that you can access immediately. So the financial considerations of paying out of pocket, you know, there's a lot more to it. And a lot of times when we say, oh, I'll just pay for it, it's because we think it's never going to happen and we're not thinking of how it's going to affect our family. But if you were to slip and fall tomorrow, okay, and need care for, for months, what are the tax implications if you have to start, you know, cashing in some of your assets to start paying for that care? What if, you know, what if the market, what if we're in a down market and you have to start paying for that? Are your assets liquid? Can you get to them right away or are they tied up in real estate? And then again, all of those assets are put into place to provide future income. And then who's going to make these decisions? Is it going to be your kids? Is it going to be your financial advisor? Who's going to make these decisions? So moving along real quick, and again, this is just going to be very big picture. I just wanted to kind of tell you what's out in the marketplace to help offset some of these expenses. There's something called traditional long-term care, and this is what I bought for my mom and dad or what I paid for for my mom and dad. And this is pure insurance. So it's exactly like health insurance, but it's designed to cover for care that's going to last longer than 90 days, and it's more or less co custodial care. So what it does is it will reimburse me for care at home, uh, in an assisted living or nursing home, <clears throat> or yeah, care at home, assisted living, and nursing home. This has the lowest premium, okay, but the premiums are not guaranteed. So the premiums can go up in the future if the insurance company mispriced the policies. A lot of the older long-term care plans were severely mispriced. So some of these older policies are seeing significant premium increases, which is really unfortunate for the people that bought them. But they still, if I was to try to replace one of these plans with a new policy, I, I, the new policies are priced so much higher, I couldn't even come close to, to what they were priced. But with traditional long-term care, purest form, however, if I don't need care and I die, I don't get anything back. 
So my father passed away from a heart attack at home. My mom died of that stroke. Neither one of them used their policy. I paid the premiums for over 20 years. I didn't get anything back, okay? But because I took on those risks, this was the lowest price. And at the time when I bought them, it's what I could afford. The other types of policies are called hybrids. These are what I call like guaranteed policies. So there are um, a long-term care policy on a life insurance chassis, okay? And the only reason there's life insurance is, is that it provides guarantees. So it locks that premium in so the insurance company can never increase it. And you can choose how long you want to pay the premium. Maybe I want to pay the policy up in 10 years. I can do that. Or 20 years. Or maybe I want to do one big lump sum. So you have more flexibility on how long you want to pay the premium. And better yet, if I died and never needed long-term care, I get everything I paid into that policy. My family would get it back as a death benefit. So naturally, these are going to be much higher, right? Because you're getting your money back one way or the other than the traditional long-term care. And then lastly, what's very popular is life insurance with the long-term care rider. So if you need life insurance, all right, but you're not in a position to, you have to pick. You know, I need life insurance. I know I need long-term care, but budget-wise, I can only do one. You can buy a life insurance policy that if you needed long-term care, it would prepay the death benefit to you on a monthly basis. It would pay out like the death benefit, either like 2% of the death benefit each month, and you could use that towards your long-term care. So, there's more than one option out there. There's also annuities that we can use that have long-term care uh, components to them as well. And, and there's, you know, they're like little puzzles, you know, how they're designed. You know, how much do you want the policy to reimburse you? Well, we kind of take a look at the average cost in your area. We look at home care cost and we look at cost sharing. Okay, so we might say, well, I want it to reimburse me $4,000 a month. Well, maybe when you need care, the cost is $6,000 a month. Well, that's okay. I'm going to get $4,000 from the insurance company, and then I'll pay $2,000 out of pocket. You also have how long. Once you're, on, um, once you're on claim or once you need care, how long do you want that policy to pay? Do you want it to pay for two years, three years? Do you want it to pay forever? Meaning, you know, if you need care for eight years, Alzheimer's, you know, that's an eight-year average care period. Do you want it to pay for eight years? We have policies that can do that. The elimination period is the deductible. Okay, so with long-term care policies, the deductible is measured in days, not dollars. So with my mom, it was, okay, the first 90 days, we're going to pay out of pocket. The first three months, we pay the bills. And then after that, her policy would have started to uh, reimburse us for her expenses. The care coordination, remember, this is what I, you know, and I kind of used this beforehand I used a, a placement agency and I was a little hesitant because I thought, well, she's going to be biased because they get paid by whoever she places, you know, my mom with. But, oh, my goodness, was she a lifesaver. I mean, she just kind of scooped me up and said, Susan, I will call you back. I, You know, I've got a couple of, you know, with three or four choices, I will set up. Uh, visits where, you know, you can go and tour, and here's who I recommend, and wow, I mean, she was, she was an angel. And then the survivorship benefit, what that means is, does the policy pay anything back if you don't need it uh, for long-term care? 
And then there's a couple of riders we can add. And again, this all depends on your particular scenario. So, you know, the considerations you need to think, because remember, this doesn't have to be an end of life event. You know, if you're single, if you're single, you know, what if you needed care? Who would step up and help you? If you're, you know, if you have a family, you know, um, how do I want to go around about protecting my daughter, Ava, if anything was to happen to me? I don't want her to be burdened with my care. So, of course, I have a policy that I put into place to make sure she wouldn't be burdened with that. And then also financial commitments. You know, I have money set aside praying she goes to college, praying, and I am not going to dip into that if I, you know, got hurt and needed care for an extended period of time. The premiums, it all depends on your age. The older you are, the more expensive the policies get. Gender, women. We, um, out of every dollar an insurance company pays for long-term care, 70 cents is for a female claim. And the reason is, it's a pretty, you know, it's we live longer. So the fact that we outlive, we tend to outlive men, you know, the longer you live, the higher the probability is that you're going to need care. So if I look at a male, um, like, you know, say you're 63 and I looked at a male's premium versus a female, we're about 40% more than men. And that all goes to utilization. Now, health, this is so important that you listen to this. You cannot buy this policy when you need it. You have to buy it when you're healthy. And that's the tough part. You know, so if your doctor says you've been diagnosed with MS, you don't have any symptoms, but you're going to. And unfortunately, you cannot buy a policy now. Uh, Parkinson's. Unfortunately, you cannot, any kind of dementia, memory loss. So the challenge is, is getting yourself to move to buy this when you're healthy. And then depending on what kind of policy that you, that you purchase, do you want something that's guaranteed? If you do, of course, you're going to pay higher premiums than something that's not guaranteed. What I like is you can use all, money from different areas to fund these policies, and that's where Josh's team can really help, is that there could be monies that you didn't realize that you could move over or reallocate to purchase an LTC plan. So again, there's all different ways that we can find the money, per se, to, to put a plan together. So your next steps really is to have the conversation with Josh and his team. Because again, I can't stress that there's one, I, I work with advisors nationwide and really what I am is I'm a trainer and, and I train them on the different types of insurance policies that are out in the marketplace and kind of where they fit. So I'll say, okay, if you have a client who has this kind of scenario, this type of policy would probably be the best fit because. So, you know, it kind of makes me, I, you know, kind of what rubs me the wrong way is when I see people promoting the same type of policy with the same design for every single one of their clients, because I know that's not, it's not right. It's not a good fit. We all, you know, your, your solution should be different from the person sitting next to you um, because we all have different, different scenarios. So, you know, the, the takeaways is that the planning, the LTC planning, it's not about you. It's about your loved ones. It's not saying you're going to need care. I mean, we all hope that we never will. But if you did, what it's doing is it's protecting your family. It's putting that barrier around your family. It's the absolute best gift you could give your children. You know, when I, when I bought the plan for my mom and dad, it was a selfish buy. You know, I really put it in place to help protect me because I knew I couldn't do what would be needed if either, if either one of them needed care for an extended period of time. 
So with the holidays coming up, this is a terrific time, you know, to start having that conversation. A lot of times your kids will say, oh, mom and dad, don't worry about it. We'll take care of you. You know, I used to say that. When my mom had the stroke and when she was in the, um, in the rehab facility, my goodness, I, there's no way. I couldn't. There's just absolutely no way I could have taken care of my mom. You know, and what I appreciated that is that I could maintain that that um, that relationship that I was the daughter. You know, even if I was a nurse, I could remain the daughter. I could oversee everything, and she could remain my mom. And then that way, there was no resentment. Uh, there was no guilt. You know, we were able to keep that that relationship until she passed. So with that, Josh, if we have any questions, um, maybe we could take them at this time. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you have any questions, folks, <clears throat> just type those into your chat feature and then I'll uh, I'll announce it uh, while we're waiting. Susan, uh, a few questions on my end is uh, I think there's been a trend over the last few years to move from the traditional long term care <clears throat> over to the. Uh, more asset based where they have a debt mm -hmm. benefit. Do you see that trend continuing and almost like a discontinuation of the old traditional care or what, what do you see happening? Because we all like the guarantees and, and if we don't need it, uh, we like to get our money back. Um, but again, the cost is really can be very prohibitive. When when I had bought the policies for my mom and dad, there was no way that I could purchase those. It would have been nice, you know, to be able to get all the, the premium back. So it really depends on the client and the affordability on what they can comfortably afford as to what is the best fit for them. Sure. So it kind of boils down to affordability. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what do you see happening in the long-term care marketplace now in terms of carriers? I know that one of the challenges historically has been that some of the carriers have dropped off. Are the carriers, are there more carriers now than there have been in the past? Well, there's more carriers coming in with these combination products because they really like those. And when interest rates go up, it actually benefits insurance companies. So with the rise of interest rates, we, ver we might be seeing some more carriers uh, come back into the marketplace next year. We always like to see more, uh, so that way we're able to uh, share the risk. We, we don't like to see one or two companies only having to take a majority of the risk. So we're, we're looking forward to seeing more carriers come back in next year. Gotcha. Um... And for people who have policies now, what is being recommended in terms of um, keeping older policies um, versus kind of if they're interested in the in the uh, hybrid policies? What what are you mm -hmm. recommending to people? So with the older policies, some of them are having incredible rate increases. And there's a, a couple of things you can do. If you have the funds to purchase a hybrid or a guaranteed product, you can do what's called a paid up option on your old plans where you essentially just stop paying premium and you, uh, you're left with like a, a bucket of benefits. So maybe you have $51,000 in that plan so if you ever needed long-term care, they would pay out 51,000 in long-term care benefits. You would purchase a hybrid product and then you would just use them both simultaneously at the same time. But by doing the paid up on the traditional long-term care, you'll stop paying premiums and then be able to put them towards, towards uh, to, I can't think of it. you'll be able to fund, help fund a hybrid product. Okay. So basically add on yes. rather, than, Thank rather you. than replace. Correct. Gotcha. Okay. Well, let's see. Um, we're not, I don't, nobody's typed in any questions here. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I'd like to ask you here. Uh, those are some of the things that I was curious about. Um, 
any other kind of trends that are happening right now in the in the space? Well, some of the states, Washington State did this, but some of the um, the state's Medicaid programs, unfortunately, a majority of their budgets are going to pay for long-term care expenses. And that's not what Medicaid was designed to do. So some of the states are looking to put in a state-funded long-term care program, which is a very minimal type of, of plan. It'll pay out maybe like a year's worth of benefits. Nothing you would want to rely on. It's kind of there as a, as a band-aid. It, it's there to slow people down from getting on Medicaid. Washington State implemented this and, they, and how to fund it is they uh, added a new payroll tax starting, it was started in July, and that payroll tax is 0.58%, which if you were making, you know, an average salary isn't a tremendous new uh, tax, but it, there was no cap. So if you're making a, a high salary, it could be a significant, significant uh, tax. Yeah. Because because they were the first ones to do it, naturally it's, you know, there's a lot of challenges with the program. We're hoping that will get cleaned up, but states like California are looking very closely uh, at trying to do something, New York, Pennsylvania, only because the states are trying to figure out how to help their Medicaid, Medicaid programs. And if you own a long-term care policy, more than likely you'll have the ability to opt out of having to pay any additional payroll tax because you've already done your planning. So we're interested to kind of see how that's going to play out. Oh, that is interesting. Yeah. Nothing on a federal level then? Never, never, because they can't figure out how to fund it. Yeah. And the Medicaid's, um, because Medicaid is funded also by the state, the federal department is saying your issue. You, yeah. you you figure it out. So interesting. Well, I'm sure it's only going to get bigger and bigger as people are living longer. So, right. Yeah. Right. Well, very good. Well, Susan, I don't have right. any questions for you. Thank you so much for your presentation today. And folks, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us on the number on your screen there. You're welcome to email us. And then if you don't already subscribe to our weekly market update e-newsletter, be sure and sign up for that. You can do that on our website or you can just shoot us an email and let us know if you'd like to sign up for it. Other than that, I hope all of you had a great holiday season. And Susan, again, thank you for your time. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. All righty. Bye-bye.